Good evening. My name is David Peters, and I'm a senior at Hillsdale College, majoring in accounting. And today, I have the distinct pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for tonight, P.J. O'Rourke. P.J. O'Rourke, an author and political humorist, was born in Toledo, Ohio, and received degrees from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and Johns Hopkins University. Mr. O'Rourke has served as editor-in-chief of National Lampoon, as Foreign Affairs Desk Chief at Rolling Stone, and as a correspondent for The Atlantic. In the fall of 2010, he was the Eugene C. Pullingham Visiting Fellow in Journalism at Hillsdale College. A former board member of Freedom House, he is currently a contributing editor for The Weekly Standard, an H.L. Mencken Fellow at the Cato Institute, and a regular panelist on the National Public National Public Radio Program, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. He is the author of many books, including On the Wealth of Nations, Parliament of Whores, Give War a Chance, and Thrown Under the Omnibus, a reader. Please welcome P.J. O'Rourke. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is, it's always a great pleasure and a great honor to be here at Hillsdale. Um, Hillsdale is just a magnificent center of clear thinking, a rare center of clear thinking. The only problem being I'm not a very clear thinker. <laughs> so thus it is when I stand up to speak at Hillsdale, uh, along with the great pleasure and the great honor comes a certain great trepidation that I am, in fact, too stupid to be speaking to you. But, in fairness to myself, I'm not just stupid. I am a student of stupidity. I am a political reporter. <laughs> I may not be qualified to speak to you about anything intelligent, but I am perfectly qualified to speak to you about this election. <laughs> we. Uh, We live in a democracy ruled by the people. 50% of people are below average in intelligence. <laughs> Mathematical fact. And that explains everything about the 2016 <laughs> presidential election. And by the way, I am full of righteous indignation about this election because I'm a political satirist and this election is fully self-satirizing. I am a political humorist, and I cannot be funnier than Hillary's pantsuits. <laughs> and I am a political commentator, and I can't get a word in edgewise with Donald Trump interrupting all the time. <laughs> so I'm not only full of righteous indignation, I'm unemployed. <laughs> so, the 2016 presidential election. We started out with about, a, about 110 presidential candidates. Uh, who, who, who were these jacklegs, these high binders, wire pullers, mountebanks, swellheads, bunkum spigots, boodle artists, and four flushers, and animated spittoons <laughs> offering themselves as worthy for, of, of America's highest office? I mean, they, they, did they take us voters for fools? Well, yeah, of course they did. Uh, uh, but, but were they also deluded? Were they also insane? Were they receiving radio broadcasts on their dental fillings telling them that they would be a good president? I mean, finally, I think rather heroically, we, the American public, narrowed it down to five. Cruz, Clinton, Kasich, Sanders, and Trump. That's not a list of presidential candidates. That's the worst law firm in the world. That's... That, that, that's, a, that's a law firm that couldn't get Caitlyn Jenner off on a charge of Bruce Jenner identity theft. I mean, <laughs> uh, see, has the office of the presidency, has it diminished in stature until it attracts only the leprechauns uh, of public life? Or have our politicians shrunk until none of them can pass the carnival test? You must be taller than the clown to, to, to run for president. Um, you know, back when this all began, it seemed as if the two candidates would inevitably uh, be Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton. A and I trembled for my country because members of the electorate would go into the voting booth and they would see the names Bush and Clinton and they would think to themselves, 
Gosh, I'm getting forgetful. I, I, I did this already. And they leave without marking the ballot, you know. Voter turnout would be 6%, you know. I mean, the shuttle from the local old age home would send a few senile Republicans to the polls. A, a Democratic National Committee bus would collect some derelicts from Skid Row. And, and, and we would have the first president of the United States elected by a franchise limited to sufferers from Alzheimer's disease and drunken bums. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what happened to Jeb Bush? I mean, Jeb had it all. He, he, he's, he's young for a Republican. Um, <laughs> f a Phi Beta Kappa, a successful businessman, and, and a former governor of Florida where balloting incompetence and corruption are vital to the GOP. Mm -hmm. Plus, he, he was rolling like a dirty dog in campaign contributions, you know? And then it just all went wrong, you know? And it turned out that even Hillary Clinton didn't have a lock on, on her nomination. And she, she, she faced a challenge from, of all people, the, the screwy, kablooey commander of the Vermont Kong, uh, 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 <laughs> Bernie Sanders, you know? Bernie's a socialist. He says so, you know? I mean... Now, you know, that may be fine in some parts of the world where they're used to socialists, you know, but, but in America, you say you're a socialist, you know, that means the guy's just saying it's okay to steal stuff, you know? <laughs> and, and Bernie is. I mean, Bernie, I mean, you know, he not only says it's okay, he thinks it's like, you know, a, a blessing. Bernie believes that swiping your flat screen TV and giving it to a, a family of pill addicts in the backwoods of Vermont is a good deed, you know? You know, Bernie, Bernie claims he wants to make America more like Europe. Great idea, because Europe's had a swell track record for, <laughs> for like 100 years now, you know? I mean, ever since Archduke Ferdinand's car got a flat in Sarajevo in 1914, you know? <laughs> make America more like Europe. Where do you even go? get all the Nazis and commies and 90 million dead people that it would take to make America more like Europe, you know? <laughs> and yet, and yet you can see what Bernie's appeal was compared to Hillary, you know? I mean, <laughs> Hillary carries more baggage than the Boeing she used as Secretary of State visiting every country that later blew up in her face in her quest to fulfill the mission of the U.S. Secretary of State, which is to accumulate frequent flyer miles. <laughs> she had Julian Assange set up her State Department email server. She, she, she put the Dalai Lama on security duty at the U.S. consulate in Benghazi. Uh, geopolitical conflicts of interest at the Clinton Foundation, they are so large they have to be weighed on Chris Christie's bathroom scale. Um, <laughs> And, and at any moment, any moment that ferret of a husband of hers might, might, might slip his leash and get up to old pants tricks running up the, running up the pant legs of young interns. You know? I mean, now, on the upside, let's be fair, on the upside, Hillary is familiar with the White House. She knows where the extra toilet paper is stored and where the spare key to the nuke missile launch briefcase is hidden, which is the, on the Truman balcony. It's the second pillar from the left. Um, <laughs> And this leaves us with Donald Trump. So I'm supporting Donald Trump. Um, I'm supporting Donald Trump because of something the great political satirist H.L. Mencken said. Mencken said, democracy is the theory that the common people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. <laughs> Trump's, uh, Trump's chief domestic policy goal will be to be on TV. Uh, and, you know, as president, uh, Trump will get to be on TV all the time, 24-7. Uh, but this might not be so bad, because just spraying his hair during commercial breaks should keep Trump too busy to push any other bird brain domestic policy goals. And Trump can yell, you're fired, uh, all he wants, um, so it will make for a healthy turnover in Trump cabinet appointees, such as Dennis Rodman, Larry King, and Vince McMahon. <laughs> Plus, uh, Trump understands the American economy. Uh, he'll grow America's economy the same way he grew his own, with bad debt, bad debt, bad debt, bad debt, and more bad debt. Uh, you know, America's average household debt right now is more than $225,000. Trump, Trump, Trump has restructured $3.5 billion of his business debt and $900 million of his personal debt 
restructured being the Trump way of saying that he didn't pay it. And we Americans know a leader when we see one. <clears throat> then imagine Trump's foreign policy. Now here's a guy who's under the illusion that he's about 10 times richer than he actually is, uh, who believes President Obama was born in Karjakistan to the Queen of Sheba and raised by <laughs> Islamicist wolves in the remote forests of Harvard Law School, um, which, which last part may be true. Um, now Russia, China, Iran, ISIS, the Taliban, and Hamas will be paralyzed with fear because who knows what this lunatic is going to do. Well, what he'll do is build hundreds of Trump casinos, Trump hotels, and Trump resorts in Moscow, Beijing, Tehran, Raqqa, Kandahar, and the Gaza Strip. Then all of them will go bankrupt the way Trump Taj Mahal, Trump Plaza Hotel, and Trump Entertainment Resorts did. Trump's going to leave Russia trying to palm off the eastern Ukraine uh, 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 on angry bondholders and, 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 and China auctioning distressed property in the Spratly Islands, you know? I mean, hell, this might work. Um, um, let's, let's try and look on the bright side uh, 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 of the 2016 presidential election. Maybe, maybe this election is a teachable moment, you know? I mean, because really, when are members of both political parties going to learn that politics, it's, it's a railroad that runs both ways? And the politicians keep creating this powerful, huge, heavy, gigantic, unstoppable freight train of a government. And then they get all shocked and scared and weepy when it looks like somebody they detest, such as Donald Trump, such as Hillary Clinton, might get a hold of the throttle, turn the train around, and run them over with it. You know, I mean, make the train smaller. Make it a little engine that could. You know, I mean, then, then you won't have so much trouble getting off the tracks when it comes slowly huffing and puffing towards you while your SUV full of rights and liberties is stalled on the railroad grade crossing, you know? I mean, I'm a libertarian. I'm a libertarian. Well, maybe, maybe not a capital L libertarian. I mean, not really a capital L libertarian, because I can't say that the libertarian party is making the kind of impact that you would expect in an election where the two major candidates are so unpopular that they seem to be engaged in a competition to see who can get unfriended most on Facebook. Um, I mean, I like Gary Johnson. I like Bill Weld. I, I wouldn't surprise myself if I ended up voting for them, but, but Johnson does seem as if maybe he not only legalized but also utilized a certain <laughs> recreational substance, and also he thinks Aleppo is a brand of dog food. <laughs> and, and I'm not at all sure what the former, like, moderate Republican governor of Massachusetts is doing on a libertarian slate. I mean, but, but Bill Weld, he does like to have a good time, and maybe running for vice president gets him invited to more cocktail parties. So Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, I think of it as the toke and tipple ticket. <laughs> Anyway, as I was saying, I'm a libertarian, you know, and that means I want all politics to go away. I, you know, I subscribe to the libertarian political philosophy, and the main thing to understand about the libertarian political philosophy is that it's not a political philosophy. It's an anti-political philosophy. Libertarians don't want to fix politics. Well, I take that back. We do want to fix politics, the way you fix a cat, the way you... <laughs> The way you spay a dog, the way you the way you castrate a dangerous bull, you know, we mean to tame these political SOBs. We're going to teach them not to beg at the table, teach them not to bark at the moon, teach them to quit licking each other's. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> going to teach politicians to heal. Going to teach politicians to come when they're called. More important, we're going to teach them the meaning of down boy. You know, and we're going to. We're going to watch them scurry away with their tails between their legs when we yell, get, you know. We're going to teach politicians domestic policy, stay off the furniture, you know. No politics on my bed. We're going to teach them foreign policy, stop making messes on other people's lawns. We're going to teach them to roll over and play dead because we're going to teach them term limits, you know. When we toss our political power to a politician, that politician is going to bring our political power right back here and drop it at our feet, and good boy, now get back in the kennel. You know? <laughs> or, such at least is the hope of every libertarian, a faint hope, perhaps. And at best, uh, those goals are going to take a long time to achieve. 
But you would think that an election like this would be some kind of lesson in libertarianism. Or not, or not. I mean, we have to consider what has caused, what has caused us to have such awful people as our only two presidential options. It's not something that's just happening in America. It's part of a larger problem. I mean, we are in the midst of a, a global revolt against the elites. The elites who created the post-World War II international order and who for the past 70 years have been running everything, running everything into the ground as far as a libertarian is concerned. Now, the hallmarks of the elite of the elites has been the expansion of collectivist political power. Political uh, power, uh, it, it has expanded in size and expense. I mean, one-third of the world's GDP is now spent by the politicians in governments. One out of every three things you make is grabbed by governments. If your cat has three kittens, one of them is a government agent. You know? <laughs> Political power has expanded in scope. Politics casts its net over every little aspect of life. Nothing is so private that it isn't tangled up in politics. I mean, in America, the latest thing has been transgender bathrooms. Now, we all know politics is crap. Now we find out that where we take one is a political issue, you know? <laughs> and people all over the world are saying, we're sick of the elites. We're sick of the supposed experts, the so-called authorities, the self-appointed know-it-alls. We're tired of people who think they know what's best for us better than we do, you know? Now, we can see this revolt against the elites. In the, we can see it in the Brexit vote in, in, in Britain. We can see it in the rise of alternative and, and, and EU skeptic political parties in Europe. Uh, we can see it in Brazil, uh, where almost every politician in the country has been charged with corruption for the simple reason that they're guilty of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, we can see the, uh, the revolt against the elites, of course, in, in the spectacle of Donald Trump. But we also have to look at his opponent. Uh, I mean, a nasty fight between the elites and the anti-elites brings forth the worst from both sides, you know? Elites are bossy, preachy, smug, domineering, self-righteous, self-impressed, self-serving, and selfish, and Hillary Clinton is their queen. You know? Now, yeah. It's, now I mean, Donald Trump may be a rich guy, a member of the 1%, uh, uh, but there's nothing elite about him. I mean, there's not, nothing, nothing elite about the way he sounds. You know, he sounds like the rest of us. Unfortunately, he sounds like the rest of us after we've had a few drinks, but he sounds like the rest, you know. I mean, Trump may be a jerk, but you can imagine playing around a golf with, with, with Trump. I mean, I have it on good authority that he doesn't, you know, cheat any worse than the rest of us do. Um, but imagine a round of golf with Hillary. She's got 20 Harvard graduate caddies who've read a lot of books about golf but have never been on the links. Um, they, they, they spend the whole match telling you, not her, what club to use. Uh, uh, Secret Service is there to make sure you take that suggestion, you know, to hit, hit from the fairway with a sand wedge. Uh, after your chip shot, uh, the cup and the pin somehow get moved closer to Hillary's lie. <laughs> lie. What, what an apposite word to use in any game that Hillary's involved in. And the scorecard mysteriously winds up on Hillary's personal email server. <laughs> I mean, any libertarian can understand the revolt against the elites. But, but, but what libertarians have to face up to is that the revolt against the elites is not actually advancing libertarian values. The revolt is not producing an increase in individual dignity, an increase in individual liberty, an increase in individual responsibility. In fact, it's had a tendency to produce the opposite. I mean, Trump vowing to build a wall between individual dignity and the United States. Many of the rising alternative EU skeptic parties in Europe are nationalistic, chauvinistic, even outright racist, and based on a fear and detestation of the refugees fleeing to Europe from the Middle East's demon chaos. You know, the fear is not irrational. The elites failed to address the root causes of the Middle East's demon chaos. Indeed, the elites seem to have been breeding demons in, in the kennels of elite diplomatic and military strategy in the Middle East, and then turning those demons loose in the Middle East as if demons had ever been an endangered species in the Middle East, as if the elites were trying to reintroduce them, you know? And one result of these elite failures has been murder 
all over the world. I mean, how much farther away from the quarrels and hatreds of the Middle East could a person get than to be at Latin night in a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida, you know? <laughs> Another result has been the refugee crisis in Europe. I mean, the elites, the elites don't care. Refugees aren't crowding the halls and jostling the elites in the European Parliament, you know? The refugees aren't building their shacks on the tennis courts at the elites' private clubs, you know? The growing populist hatred of refugees, it's a libertarian tragedy. Uh, elites are refusing to address the cause of this immigration, and populist anti-elites are refusing to accept the effects. The result is this, it's an across-the-board crackdown on immigration. Immigrants are simply being dumped in refugee camps and squatter shanty towns, and, and if they have managed to make it across the border, in slums. You know? and not only is, is populist hatred of these refugees a libertarian tragedy, populism itself is a libertarian tragedy. Since the beginning of democracy in Athens in the 5th century BC, the greatest danger to democratic institutions has always been the demos, the people themselves, the very item that constitutes democracy. It's like democracy doesn't contain the seeds of its own destruction, it contains the roots, the fruits, and the whole damn tree. You know? Each person in a democracy is, of course, an individual, the way we libertarians say that each person is. But when the persons become the people, and the people become populace, you watch out. You know what I, mean? I mean, what do you think would have happened if that charming old bloke Socrates, lovable eccentric, full of silly questions, had gone around Athens personally asking each Athenian, should I be condemned to death? I mean, individuals would never have killed Socrates. They had to become a mob first. And what always comes to the fore in a mob? Mobsters, the so-called alt-right in KKK robes, or, or, or less comically, Marine Le Pen in France, or, or tragically, Vladimir Putin, populist champion of the revolt against the crooked and foolish elites of post-Soviet Russia. There are populist elements in the neo-Maoism of, of Xi Jinping, uh, using it to root out corruption, uh, uh, using that as his excuse for oppression. And there are populist aspects to, to, to Islamic terrorism itself. Uh, a fanatical interpretation of, of jihad was, was first and foremost a rebellion against certain Muslim elites, elites who were and are Saddam Hussein, Husseini Mubarak, Muammar Gaddafi, Bashar al-Assad, pigs, just pigs. See, you know, but populism seeks the cohesion of individuals into a collective group, a social class, an ethnicity, an identity with its own identity politics. And this is inimical to every libertarian principle. Individual dignity is an individual quality. There is no such thing as group dignity. And what is group freedom? It sounds like the kind of freedom drug gangs on the south side of Chicago want, you know? And group responsibility, collective responsibility, we know what that is. That's, what, what, that's the way Palestinian extremists regard every Israeli, the way Israeli extremists regard every Palestinian. You know, the West Bank, that's a great model for a society. But exactly why? Why isn't a revolt against the elites teaching a libertarian lesson? I mean, we should be learning the value of individual freedom from the failure of the elites and the fiasco of their vast collective political power. Good things are made by free individuals in free association with other free individuals. And notice, that's how we make babies, you know? <laughs> individual freedom is about bringing things together. Politics is about dividing things up, you know? Elites would have us make babies by putting the woman over on this side of the room and the men over on that side of the room, and while the elites stand in the middle taxing sperm and eggs. You know? <laughs> but we aren't. We aren't learning lessons in individual freedom, basically because the world is such a scary place right now. We're faced with frightening speed of technological change, worrisome economic instability. We're faced with violent fanaticism. And fear is a bad school marm. We have got a monster at the blackboard. Now how can kids learn even two plus two if all they can think is, hey, teacher is huge and slimy and scaly and has three heads, you know? So we turn for help 
to the big stupid bullies in the back of the room, and that would be Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. We don't know who else to turn to, which is another reason why we're not getting a libertarian lesson. I mean, libertarianism depends upon civil society, and lately our society just hasn't been so civil. But more to the point, the expansion of public politics leaves little room for private association. Our community organizations, our clubs, our lodges, fellowships, brotherhoods, our union halls, and our churches are no longer playing important roles in the drama of civics. They have been upstaged by politics. Politics has become such an obese, operatic performer, warbling so loudly that none of us bit players can be heard. And politics is so fat that we are shoved into the orchestra pit. It is over when the fat lady sings. I mean, every grievance, no matter how minor, such as the speed of our internet connections, results in a political demonstration. Now, this was not always so. The abolition of slavery in the British Empire was largely a private social enterprise. The abolition movement was started in the 18th century by Quakers, who had limited political influence. As, as dissenters, they weren't eligible to stand for parliament. The abolition movement drew its strongest support from, from, from women and, in, and the Industrial Revolution's working class. Uh, they, they had no political influence. British franchise was still limited by property qualifications, and women didn't have the vote at all. And yet, abolition prevailed. Not only were all the slaves in the British Empire freed, but the British Navy fought the slave trade everywhere else in the world all because of community organizations, clubs, lodges, and fellowships. And this is, I mean, it's amazing. This is like saying, my bowling league cured Zika, you know? <laughs> well, could be done, you know, if you get more research scientists to learn how to bowl, you know? <laughs> or let Hillsdale College be your bowling league, okay? You know, it can cause a little discouragement being a libertarian. Um, not that we are discouraged. Brave people don't get discouraged. And it takes a lot of bravery being a libertarian. Um, bravery to be logical in the face of the absurd, informed in the face of ignorance, right in the face of wrong. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers and sisters, populists at home in bed with their bad political ideas shall think themselves a curse they were not here tonight. You know? Libertarians always have to accept the fact that politically libertarianism is a hard sell. People, people want easy answers. There are intelligent answers, there are correct answers, there are even obvious answers. But politically, there are no easy answers. Libertarians say, elect us and we will do less for you. Not a vote getter, you know. Never mind that less is often the very thing that needs doing most. Because libertarianism is a hard sell, uh, there's an abiding temptation among libertarians to retreat into the apolitical. And, you know, given what politics has been like these days, apolitical has got a nice ring to it. But, but in fact, there's no such thing as apolitical. Politics is like gravity. There's no getting away from it on this planet. Now, it's fine to have no opinion about gravity or to love it when it keeps the baby in the crib or, and hate it when you step on the bathroom scale, but you can't ignore it. You know, maybe you're a progressive libertarian, you know, a left libertarian, and you need gravity to keep your head full of spacey anarchist ideas from floating away. Maybe you're a conservative libertarian, a free market libertarian, and you need gravity so that you can shove the competition to the ground, you know? But you can't pretend gravity doesn't exist, and you can't pretend that politics doesn't exist either. That's, that's the same as stepping into thin air from a, a 40th story window, you know? A specifically a 40th story window in Trump Plaza. Um, Libertarianism is a political philosophy that fundamentally opposes politics that is necessary for libertarians to engage with politics. Politics is the question of an individual's relationship to a society. The question of an individual's relationship uh, uh, to society is a bad question. It's a bad question, and to judge by most politics, past and present, the question has a bad answer for individuals. Libertarianism exists to change the answer and the question. Individuality is a fact. Politics is an intellectual abstraction, a way of thinking about persons collectively as if a bunch of people were a single thing. The populist cohesion of individuals into a group, the people, the nation, the state. Politics is imaginary. Never mind that this fictitious concept can cause oppression, slaughter, war, and occasionally benefits. Imagination is powerful. 
Individuals, alas, are not so powerful, but individuals aren't fictitious. Every individual is actual, with actual needs and wants, actual joys and sorrows, actual freedoms and responsibilities. People are real. Politics is an idea. There are names for the kind of think thinking that, 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 that regard ideas as more important than people. One of those names would be Paul Pot. Mm -hmm. Individuals do not, in fact, have a real relationship with politics. Individuals have a real relationship only with other individuals. Now, of course, there may be a lot of individuals with whom we have that relationship. For example, we in this room, we, we, we probably would not pledge our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor to some harebrained collectivist political idea of a society, but we would, I hope, willingly risk all that for the reality of the 320 million individuals who live in America. However, no one, and by no one I mean the populace in revolt against the elites around the world specifically, no one should let this willingness to sacrifice mislead them into notions of political collectivism. You know, when the ancient Hebrews rebelled, and they rebelled against the uh, bondage of the Egyptian elite, they, they no doubt regarded themselves as a people, a nation, a state, a, cohesive indiv of, uh, a cohesion of individuals into a collective group. God said nope. God said nope, and God gave the Hebrews a time out. And when he gave them a time out, he delivered his Ten Commandments, and every one of those commandments was a commandment to the individual. You, the specific individual you, you shalt do this, you shalt not do that. I'm talking to you, no group discounts. <laughs> Closest God comes to mentioning the populist idea of a cohesive collective group is the Tenth Commandment, when he forbids the Hebrews from practicing collectivism, God said, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass. Don't, said God, go staking a claim on other people's asses, mind your own. <laughs> okay, that's, that's everything I know. Um, but uh, if anybody has... If anybody has any questions, I'll make up some other stuff, okay? <laughs> so, we have the mic bearers here, and they will go around and hand the mic to people. They've done so already. Thank you. Ma'am. For coming here tonight. Thank I've you enjoyed your books in the past, and it was obvious you were very liberal in your younger days, and you sort of followed the observation, I guess, of Winston Churchill, that if you uh, are not liberal when you're young, you have no heart, and if you're not conservative when you're older, you have no brain. Is there any one thing that changed you from a liberal path to a more conservative? Yes, or? there was okay. definitely a change. I mean, yeah, I followed the, I'm a child of the 60s, I followed the zeitgeist of the 60s, but we should always all remember the, us, uh, us older people in the audience should remember to always be a little forgiving of kids for being left wing. Because there's this idea in Marxism, and Lenin stated it specifically, that from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Now, we all know that's rubbish. It absolutely doesn't work, except for one place. Where is the one place that that actually works? The family, right, the family. And what do kids know about? Where is their whole model for, like, political construct is the check from dad that comes every month, you know? So, of course, they're lefties, you know? Now, me, what happened to me was I eventually got a job, you know? I got a job. I got a job for $150 a week. We got paid every two weeks, and I was really looking forward to that $300, and so was my landlord. And, uh, and then I got a check. Well, I got my first paycheck, and I'd net it out at like $179.95 after federal tax and state tax and city tax and Social Security and health care plan contributions and union dues and this, that. I netted out, and, and I go, wait a minute, I'm a communist. I've demonstrated for communism. I've protested for communism. I've vandalized for communism. I've rioted for communism. I finally get a job with a big capitalist corporation, and I find out we've got communism already. They just took half my money. You know? I'm not Rockefeller. So, yeah, uh, it changed things pretty quickly. Ma'am. I'm trying to have a personal 
uh, vendetta against. I don't want to vote for either one of those people. And I wonder what the chances are if we could get more people just to vote, just to keep one of them from getting 50 percent, more than 50 percent. You know, I, I, unfortunately, is this is going to be a situation to be endured, not avoided. It's really impossible now. Uh, you know, you would have thought that the Libertarian Party, that this would be a tremendous moment for them. I don't know why they put, put in such an utterly lackluster. But even throwing it into the House is just going to give it to the Republicans to decide, and they will decide. For There really is no way around. We're going to have one or, or, or the other of these people, and about the only thing we can do is get prepared. Uh, the problem here is, of course, with Trump, I, I don't know what to prepare for exactly, you know. <laughs> And the problem with Hillary is I know exactly what to prepare for, you know. It's an awful, awful decision, and, and, and I personally am, am hoping that, that, that I, you live in, you know, here in the Midwest, you're all in swing states. Probably everybody in this room is a, is a voter in a swing state, and, uh, or potentially a swing state. And I live in New Hampshire, which is also a swing state, so it's like our individual, one little, itty bitty little vote might actually matter, you know, and that's a, I don't want that re kind of responsibility myself. You know? <laughs> I'm just hoping that somebody is 20% ahead uh, 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 when, on, 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 on ballot day uh, in my state, in New Hampshire, and so I can go in and tick off Gary Johnson um, and let him find out Aleppo on his own. <laughs> Sir. Mr. Omar, thank you so much for your time today and coming out and giving us a lecture. Um, so my question is going to focus on the intersection between what you mentioned about group dignity and then the libertarian movement. So what I'm curious about one is, first of all, if there's no such thing as group dignity, then what isn't saying the libertarian movement by definition a paradox of sorts or a contradiction? And then furthermore, Secondly, if there's no such thing as, a, as group dignity in terms of a political movement, rightly so, then how do, how do libertarians actually make their case for these ideals of free markets and these ideals of individual liberty that they so hope to achieve? I'm sorry, you got to slow down a little bit. What's that last part? I got the first part. Right. So how do libertarians make their case as, okay. a, as right. for those ideas that they all hold? Gotcha. There's no such thing as group all right. Thank you. See, the, the thing about libertarianism as a political party does turn out to be paradoxical and also ineffective, as we have seen. And I asked Rand Paul about this. I know Rand a little bit. I've interviewed him a couple of times. We've had some long talks. And I, he said, you know, the thing, because Rand should know, you know, because uh, who his dad is, you know, about, about libertarians. He said, the thing with libertarians is they're rigidly logical. They're very, very much, they, they believe in logic, and they're very logical when they approach issues, and they are so logical that they completely convince themselves that they are utterly and absolutely right. And they are so, they're, they're, they're much more right than anybody else, including all the other libertarians. And he said, you know, what happens is there's so much logic flying around that if you put two libertarians in a room, you get three positions. You know? <laughs> And it just really what libertarianism is in, 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 at its heart, it's an attitude. It's a measure. It's a, not, not even an attitude. It's a measuring stick. It's a yardstick. In, what libertarian does is in any person, any policy, any political party, it measures, it asks three questions. Does this, does this increase human liberty? Does it increase human dignity? Does it increase human responsibility? That's the third one. That's the, that, that's the part that, that you always kind of want to forget about. You know, I don't like the responsibility part. Can I just have the liberty and dignity? <laughs> no. No, you have to have the responsibility too. So libertarianism is really a lens to look at things through more than an, it's not an ideology per se. It's a, it, it's, it, it's, it's a measuring stick. Sir. H.L. Mencken. Yes. Once said, if voting made any difference, they wouldn't let us do it. <laughs> now, you are the H.L. Mencken something or other. Why isn't the conclusion of your talk that we shouldn't vote at all? The whole country should protest and say, we are not voting this year. Well, I mean, again, it's a tempting position. No, I, I think Mencken had that a little wrong. 
if voting mattered, they wouldn't let us do it for free. <laughs> We'd have to buy our votes the way the Democratic Party does. You know? uh, and they, they are good at that. Um, I don't, there's, there, there, there are three good reasons to vote. Uh, he is loathsome, so, so you can vote against him. She is detestable, so you can vote against her. And, or you can, you know, put the third party. But really, the most important vote is down ballot. This is the real reason. Doesn't matter what, you know. We're going to get a bad deal, no matter what the outturn of the presidential race is. But we have to have... I know the Republicans have not been very effective. I know they have not been like uh, uh, the kind of purists that they claim to be. I know that they, they're sort of idea free, but they do act as a break on, 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 on wild democratic, huge expansions of government and entitlement programs. It's extremely important that we have a democratic House of Representatives and a democratic Senate to stop, not because what they will do, but what they can stop from happening. So what's that? Oh, did I? Okay. Yeah. Well, they stink too. <laughs> no. no, it's very important that we have a Republican House of Representatives and a Republican Senate, uh, and uh, uh, because just just because of their breaking power, not because of anything good that they will do. Ma'am. Thank you for bringing humor to the other side of the looking glass for all of us. Um, there is something that's not down ballot that's important, and that's the Supreme Court. Well, yeah, this is like, um, I have a lot of trouble with Trump, as you can probably tell. Uh, but I gotta say that who gets appointed to the Supreme Court is a worry, wor very, very worrisome thing. And uh, I wish I had a little bit more reliable view of, of you know, I wish I, I wish I felt he were a little more trustworthy about who he would actually appoint. but. It is a strong um, pro-Trump argument. There are other strong pro-Trump arguments. I mean, uh, I don't like the guy, but I'm not, uh, I'm not deaf to the arguments for him, and I don't, I don't despise other people who are going to decide to vote for him. Um, the, one of the strongest was from a very good friend of mine who's on the Wall Street Journal's bo editorial board, and a man I respect enormously, a very good Catholic, and uh, um, with a big family of adopted children from, from bad places around the world, uh, kids who really needed to be adopted, great guy. He said, every president brings a few thousand people into office with him or her. Not just the appointees, of, but, but, but all the hangers on, you know, and all the campaign staff and the, and the friends in, in journalism and the influencers and the influenced and so on. But it's a big comet trail. Every president brings these several thousand people in with him. He said, uh, People that Trump brings in may be terrible. They, they may be utter bums and get up to all sorts of mischief and cheat on their expense accounts and behave like idiots. He said, but the people that Hillary Clinton is going to bring in, every single one of them hates me personally. Hates my religion, hates my values, and wants to take my money. Every single one of them. That is a strong argument. You know? And of course, that includes the Supreme Court. You know, I mean, that's, that's part of that com dirty comet trail that Hillary will bring in with her. Okay, do we have any more questions out there? We do. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I describe myself as massively libertarian, and this election has been sort of disappointing to me due to the current canons we have to offer. How does the Libertarian Party move forward from this election and become a popular party that people do not vote simply as a protest, but vote because they agree with the ideals that it presents? Well, I don't think there's much hope for the Libertarian Party. It's been around for a long time. It's been around since 1970 or 71. It's never made any significant impact. I think that Libertarians, I mean, maybe there is, maybe, it, maybe one of the political parties, I'm guessing the GOP, will fall apart uh, at the end of this. But, um, uh, uh, and, and will be time for another party. But we gotta remember, political parties are not really very American. America doesn't really have political parties. We have a pair of Venn, di it's a Venn diagram. 
we have tendency, we have political tendency. We, uh, uh, political parties like they've got in Europe have ideologies, they have, uh, like, like you have membership cards, they've got dues, you can be expelled from them, you know, they vote to see who their leader will be, et cetera, et cetera. We don't do that, we don't do that. We just have two general tendencies. You know, you got like the, the stupid party and the silly party, you know? Uh, uh, I, I'm, like I said, I'm stupid, so I vote for the stupid party, the Republicans, uh, you know, but then over there you got the silly party. And one, you know, one is just kind of like dumb and leave me alone, and the other one is like government can fix everything, you know, and, it, and it's, <laughs> and those tendencies often have quite a bit of overlap as they did during the 50s and, and, and even up until, in the 60s up until uh, uh, Goldwater ran for president. Uh, those, par those parties often overlap quite a bit, and sometimes they get so they're just the Venn diagram, the circles in the Venn diagram are barely, barely touching. Libertarians have got to realize that Americans like vote according to like broad tendency, not according to like a specific like line of of rigid reasoning, a, cer a certain sort of ideology, which as I pointed out before, the libertarians themselves can't agree on, you know, let alone get all of us to agree with them. You know, a, a, a party really has to be, it has to be a big tent. In the United States, a political party has to be a big tent. You know, you can lure everybody into the tent with bribes, uh, uh, the way the Democrats do, you know, or you can lure them into the tent with promises, the way the Republicans do, um, but it has to be a big tent. Sir. Yeah, a number of years ago, read that you felt that uh, Scandinavian socialism works. That what? That Sa Scandinavian or Swedish socialism yeah. works. Yeah. Still believe that? Uh, yeah, to an extent. I mean, this isn't, uh, socialism in the Scandinavian countries does work pretty well. The reason is that the countries are tiny and the people are all alike. <laughs> so if you set up a government system where it takes a lot of your resources away from you and then gives you a lot of benefits, that works okay if, you, if everybody agrees on what those benefits are. If you know, if you got free grad school, that's great in Scandinavian countries because everybody goes to grad school, you know, so it works fine. Now that these countries are becoming more diverse, it's working less and less well. But I mean, it's, you know, every time they talk about the, 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 the marvel of the Nordic systems, they're forgetting how tiny and diverse these countries are. They're not a fit model for a gigantic country like ours. And the other thing is we don't have, there is no national, there is no mission to America. America's mission is for everybody to get a chance to try to do what they want to do as long as it doesn't like physically injure other people who are trying to do what they want to do, you know? So, I mean, this is, America doesn't have a purpose. America is not a nationality. America is a set of practices and beliefs. Uh, and, and so, they're just useless models. Um, the other thing was, or something else I was gonna uh, uh, say about that was, oh yeah, it was Milton Friedman. Uh, there's also, you know, when you have like a very cohesive group of people who are all alike, uh, they tend to have similar characteristics, and so once Milton Friedman was arguing with a, with a Swedish politician, and a Swedish politician was saying, in Sweden we have no poverty. And Milton Friedman said, well, that's interesting because among Swedes in America we've got no poverty either. You know? <laughs> Who else have we got? Uh, the the uh, movie Lincoln. When I first watched it, I didn't quite understand a lot of the nuances in the script, so I went to the internet and downloaded the script and read it, and one of the recurring themes in the script is how Lincoln felt that the office of the presidency changed him, how he had to mold himself to the presidency. Could you speculate, well, postulate a Trump victory? Could you? Could you <laughs> project into the future and kind of determine if Trump will change the office or the office will change Trump? I think the office is a pretty big, important mold. And I think the office will probably change him. It would be my hope that the office would change him. We are not working with the same raw materials as we were with Lincoln. <laughs> we do have to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> who 
Who else have we got here? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, given your your proposition that uh, libertarian is in more an attitude than perhaps a party, where do you see the hope or the course uh, for increasing our cultural focus on the individual when our education system has such a stranglehold on the bribery that the left seems to uh, live by? You know, the truth of the matter is, as I get older, I get more pessimistic. Uh, it's just, it just happens to us all, I think, is that um, uh, the tendency in America and, and generally in Western democracies has been a, you know, an ever-expanding size and scope and expense of government. And that um, what's going to have to happen is, is a crisis. It's going to have to be, it's going to have to work so badly. It's not going to go away until it's really broken. And when it's really broken, people will come to realize, now we, had a, 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 we, we, must do, we have to do something different. Uh, we had a little preview of that, I think, with both uh, uh, Ronald Reagan to a certain extent and Margaret Thatcher to a greater extent. Uh, it will probably require a, 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 a worse crisis than the stagnation that Britain was facing or, the, or Jimmy Carter. Now, the other thing, the thing that makes me pessimistic about this is that the older you get, the more you realize how little you ever desire a crisis, just how many people get hurt in a crisis, just how awful a crisis is. As a young, imaginative, and hopeful kid, it's, it's sort of fun to say, oh, yeah, and then we'll have a big crisis, and then everything will get fixed, you know? Well, won't that be fun? Well, crises don't turn out to be any, any fun, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and they do turn out to hurt a lot of people. But we will probably, we will have to probably push our financial system, um, which is behaving extremely, I mean, our government side of our financial system is, you know, very much just printing worthless money uh, in order to pay for all this junk. And we will probably have to push it to the breaking point before we realize that you just can't have everything and have it all for free. Um, and, but like I say, you don't, you, 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 at the same time you know that this crisis has to happen someday, you sort of hope, could that be after me? <laughs> Maybe. Thank you very much. Thank you.